Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Craig Latham, and I'm the Executive Director of NERI. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Clinical Decision-Making in Cases of Children with Problematic Sexual Behavior, presented by Shell Millington and Amanda Mitten. Before turning this over to Shell and Amanda, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about NERI Press. Our mission is to share current research and best practices emerging in our field. For many years, we accomplished that mission only through book sales. But with changes in the last several years in the publishing and technology worlds, we now disseminate knowledge in several additional ways. Over the last six years, Neary Press has also offered online courses, a free monthly newsletter, in-person trainings, and these webinars delivered by our internationally recognized authors and other experts in the field. It's important to us at Neary Press and Training Center to hear what kinds of information, training, resources, and books you want. So please contact us with your suggestions, questions, and feedback whether positive or negative. Just out of curiosity, how many people have participated in a NERI Press webinar before? Tim, can you launch the poll, please? All right, while people are voting, I'll continue. Um, I'll talk more about this at the end of the webinar, but I'd just like to make the pitch that if you find these webinars helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a sponsor of our webinar series. You can think of our webinars like Car Talk on NPR. It's your sponsorship that helps make this series happen and that allows us to offer our webinars for free to the thousands of clinicians and other professionals who have participated in them over the last several years. Please consider becoming a sponsor of this webinar series. If you become a sponsor now, you'll get guaranteed seats to not only this season's remaining two webinars in May and June, but also to all webinars in the 2018-2019 season. We will register you and 15 staff members from your organization for each webinar, offer you a free gift of two Neary Press books, and mention you in all of our publicity about the webinar series and each webinar. Before we get started with Shell and Amanda's presentation, there are a couple more things I'd like to share. First, I want to let you know the learning objectives for this workshop. Participants will learn about evidence-based treatment components of cognitive behavior therapy for problematic sexual behavior, or PSBCBT, designed to reduce or eliminate problematic sexual behavior in children. They will understand treatment decision-making with standardized instruments to assess co-occurring symptoms and learn about the timing of treatment elements, setting priorities for treatment components, and how to apply this in the clinic environment. Second, slides for this webinar are currently ready to download from the Neary Press webinars page at www.neerypress.org slash webinars if you'd like to follow along. As Tim mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can also download the slides right here from your control panel on the right-hand side. The YouTube recording from this webinar will be posted on the Neary Press website within two weeks. This is a little slower than usual, and that is because we are rolling out the new Neary Press website. Please check it out in a few days and let, you know what you, let us know what you think. Third, when the workshop is over, please answer the short survey at the end. We would love to have your feedback. And finally, in about two weeks, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recordings and to a certificate of attendance that you can download. Now let me introduce our speakers. Shell Millington is an LPC at the Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center, Center on Child Abuse and Neglect. She received her master's degree from the University of Central Oklahoma. Her clinical experiences include evidence-based interventions with children and adolescents with problematic sexual behaviors an assessment of children prenatally exposed to substances. She is a level one trainer in PCIT and a trainer in the Oklahoma University Problematic Sexual Behavior CBT model, in which she provides national training and consultation. Amanda Mitten is also an LPC, also at the o Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center, Center on Child Abuse and Neglect. She received her master's degree from the University of Central Oklahoma. She is a certified therapist in trauma-focused CBT, a treatment for children affected by trauma, and she is trained and certified in PCIT, a treatment for children with disruptive behavior. Amanda is a trainer in the Oklahoma University Problematic Sexual Behavior CBT model, in which she provides national training and consultation. Thank you for joining us, Amanda and Shell. Um, go ahead and help us understand what's going on.
Kim, do we have a problem with their sound? I cannot hear yes. them on the computer. They're muted. Shell and Amanda, can you please unmute yourselves? We can't hear you. Can you unmute them, Tim, or do they have to do that themselves? Because they're on a telephone, they I it says to click here and send them a pin, which I did. Uh, I did that. I think that's what they're checking. They're okay. Meeting for. So for those of you listening in, sorry to um, have this little glitch here. Even the most rehearsed things can go off track a bit. We'll get them back on as soon as we can get the technical details worked out here. I think they're logging back in right now. I notice there's a couple questions from people who say the sound is interrupted. Um, and my question is whether that was true when Tim and I were talking um, or was it just when Amanda and Shell were talking? I think that was um, a question from Rhonda. Oh, sounds like our presenter just joined us. Can you hear us now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm not sure what happened. We just rebooted and tried again. Excellent. Thank you. Please go ahead. We're ready. Great. I'm just going to hop on to the learning objective piece. So our focus today will be covering evidence-based treatment components from problematic sexual behavior, cognitive behavioral therapy, designed to reduce and eliminate problematic sexual behavior in children. We also want to focus on making treatment decisions with the use of standardized measurements when there are co-occurring symptoms. And finally, how to time treatment elements, decision making surrounding the prioritization of treatment components, and how to apply this in a clinical setting. So what is problematic sexual behavior? This is a term that encompasses a continuum of behaviors that involve private parts of the body and behaviors that are developmentally inappropriate and could be harmful to the youth demonstrating the behaviors or others. And our focus today is on children 12 years and younger. Colleagues recently provided two webinars explaining the overview and assessment of these youth. If you would like to learn more, we would really encourage you to review those webinars. There is not a distinct profile of children with problematic sexual behavior. It's a very diverse group with no pattern of psychological, social, or demographic factors. Both males and females demonstrate problematic sexual behavior, and it's really important to note that this is not in and of itself a diagnosis. These children, though, may present with other diagnoses to take into consideration. We also want to point out that they could have ADD, ADHD, PTSD, a whole litany of issues, and we need to be equipped to make clinical decision makes. So let's provide a little bit of information on how to treat youth with problematic sexual behavior. To start, we want to overview a research study that evaluated treatment for children with problematic sexual behavior. Two groups were identified for children with PSB. One group received cognitive behavioral therapy and the other received dynamic play therapy. Their caregivers participated in a concurrent caregiver group. A comparison group was also included of children who did not have problematic sexual behavior, but had disruptive behaviors. The study evaluated multiple reporting sources 10 years after treatment 
to determine how many of these views demonstrated future problematic sexual behavior. What was found is quite remarkable. The children who had received dynamic play therapy had an 11% recidivism rate, meaning 11% have problematic sexual behavior after treatment. Those in the comparison group had a 3% recidivism rate, and those of the youth that had cognitive behavioral therapy had a 2% recidivism rate. So this shows us not only is treatment wildly effective, cognitive behavioral therapy is where we need to start. Further research identified what treatment elements were most closely tied to the reduction and elimination of problematic sexual behavior. What was found was caregiver involvement is key. Other components specific to treatment was providing coverage of behavior parent training, rules surrounding sexual behavior, sex education, abuse prevention, and providing children with strategies to make good choices or impulse control techniques. Additional treatment components to implement when children have problematic sexual behavior is a plan for preventing future problematic or illegal sexual behavior. We also want to encourage pro-social activities and positive peer interactions. We really want to emphasize that adult treatment components are not appropriate for these youth and are in fact found to be harmful. Something else to emphasize is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy has also been shown to be an effective treatment for children with problematic sexual behavior, but that, of course, is when those, these youth have a trauma history and related symptoms. This is an overview of our treatment, so OU's problematic sexual behavior cognitive behavioral therapy, and you can see the modules that we cover sexual behavior rules, supervision and monitoring of these youth, and you can see the CBT base here with feelings identification and rating of intensity, self-calming or relaxation skills, self-control and behavior management for their caregivers, social skills, abuse prevention, sex education, some continued work on behavior management, and a piece on empathy and apology. Within our modules, you can see that those components referred to in a previous slide are really honed in on in treatment for our program. It's very common for these youth to present with, current, with concerns other than problematic sexual behavior. We discuss this as a very diverse group, and so co-occurring symptoms are widely, wildly endorsed. Many articles have been written noting the overlap of presented issues in addition to problematic sexual behavior such as active trauma symptoms or disruptive behaviors or a combination of all three. When you face these presentations, we have to identify how to proceed with effective treatment to best help the youth and the family that you're serving. When you have a case with a variety of presented symptoms, we have some really useful questions to guide the process. Ask yourself, in what settings are these behaviors occurring? How impairing are the behaviors? When was the last time that each behavior occurred? What is the frequency, duration, and intensity of each behavior? And consider if any of those are intrusive in nature. Also ask, what's the parent capacity for addressing each behavior? And what, to what extent is the safety of other children compromised by the behaviors that are endorsed? Does the child have a memory of the traumatic event in question? Has the family or child engaged in previous treatment to address these behavior issues? What other systems are involved with the family? And finally, what behavior is most distressing to the child and caregiver? When there are other sources involved, like child welfare, or juvenile justice, you want to take those reactions into response as well. So these questions and the answers you identify assist in guiding how to best proceed and what and when to target <clears throat> with the presented, presenting behaviors. Again, there's some other factors to consider. Ask yourself, is the problematic sexual behavior, disruptive behavior, or trauma symptoms intrusive, current, and impairing? And let those factors assist with your decision. Secondly, we know we have evidence-based treatment designed to address every one of these concerns. We can use components from all when needed, but we may not need to, so it's important to evaluate where to start for treatment, 
when and if to switch to another treatment component, and how can we combine treatment elements appropriately. Finally, once a treatment and start point is identified, it's vital to evaluate progress, symptoms, and behaviors to guide the need to continue with the current treatment, shift to another treatment modality, or combine elements. And standardized measurements are very helpful here. When a primary concern is identified, then evaluate the evidence-based treatment shown to address it and review related considerations. So if your primary target is problematic sexual behavior, it's important to implement a treatment to address the problematic sexual behavior. Considerations here are that we have an ability within PSVCVT to monitor and reduce trauma symptoms. Also, it's common that that modality is implemented in a group to enhance social support and cover behavior parent management and positive parenting practices. Those things lend themselves to treating disruptive behaviors and trauma symptoms as well. If your focus is for disruptive behaviors, treatment can be through parent-child interaction therapy or other behavior parenting treatments. Again, with this, we can still monitor trauma symptoms and sexual behaviors, and we can include rules in psychoeducation on sexual behavior. You can see how you have flexibility to still address other issues within an evidence-based treatment. For trauma symptoms as a primary concern, we recommend trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Within that treatment, there is again the ability to provide safety planning and use rules to guide sexual behaviors and monitor behavior concerns in sexual behavior. All of these treatment modalities have embedded skills that have the ability to impact a variety of behaviors, but a start point and reevaluation allows us to ensure we are impacting what a specific case needs. All right, so Shell just did an exceptional overview and a very fast one, we might add, of um, you know, problematic sexual behavior, what are the recommended treatment components, what is research telling us makes it the most effective, um, and also that there's these overlap of symptoms that we often see in our kiddos. And I think anecdotally, um, thinking about caseloads and families that we've served, um, a, a very large portion of them come in with um, these overlapping concerns, whether it's problematic sexual behavior and disruptive behavior, um, also with some trauma symptoms, um, a little bit of all three, a little bit of two of them. Um, it, it's, it's really common. So Shell and I did a lot of thinking about what would make the most sense in talking in more depth about how do we make these clinical decisions? What is it that we're doing? What are our thought processes? And we thought it would be most helpful to, to make it very applicable. So what we've done is we've um, pulled a clinical case, we've changed all the information. Um, this is not, we're not violating HIPAA or having any protected health information in there. Feel the need to provide that caveat. Um, but what we're gonna do is kind of walk through this case and we're gonna talk about what presenting concerns were, what measures we used to help to make our decisions and then what our ultimate decisions were and anything that we did from there. Um, my hope is that this will help it be, um, will really drive the points home and help it be more um, hands-on and applicable for you all in your clinical practice. I hope that this is a case that maybe you all can relate to or have seen something um, of a similar regard. So this is Kevin. Um, he is an eight-year-old Caucasian male. He was referred by his Child Protective Services um, uh, worker. Um, he is in a foster placement. Um, some of the presenting concerns are that he um, has excessive self-touch um, in public and at home, which is, um, I don't know if y'all remember when we discussed um, what the sexual behavior rules are in a previous webinar, that would be considered breaking a sexual behavior rule. Um, and that rule would be, it is okay to touch your private parts in private as long as you're in private and don't take too much time. So we're breaking multiple aspects of this here. It's in public um, in, at home um, as well as in other public settings. Um, the next one um, presenting concern is that he's engaged in kissing, fondling, and oral genital contact with a five-year-old sister, again, breaking sexual behavior rules. I want to also draw your attention to the piece where it's uh, mentioning it's a five-year-old sister, which, as we'll talk about in a little bit, has um, impacted his um, placement um, and his contact with his sister. Um, finally, um, he has engaged in touching with same-age peers at school. So we're seeing that the sexual behavior has impacted um, 
his placement as well as multiple environments, so school, home, and public behavior as well. Um, his foster parents also state that they have problems with defiance, aggression, noncompliance, again, across multiple environments. So I know when I'm first looking at this, I'm kind of seeing, oh my goodness, he's breaking multiple sexual behavior rules and he has really high behavior problems as reported by foster parents. Um, so I think it kind of presents here with the information that we have that it's a kind of a textbook we need to do PSB CBT. But I think some things that we're missing just with this information is additional support for making that decision. So let's talk a little bit about what that information could give us. So we know he's in um, custody of Child Protective Services. Um, so that tells us that there was some kind of maltreatment. Um, and so we need more information about that. Um, so he's removed from bio mom and stepdad. Um, because of being shown pornography, as well as witnessing um, his caregivers engaging in sexual intercourse. Um, he was recipient of um, sexual behavior that was initiated by his older half-brother. Um, so at the time that Kevin was four and his brother was 10. Um, he also has incurred physical abuse by his stepfather. Um, and then there was a high um, degree of neglect in the home he was living in. So poor supervision and living in a hotel. I also want to note that if you think back to um, previous webinars, um, and again, if you guys have not seen those, highly recommend, because uh, we're going to be referring to those a couple of times here, um, is um, some of the risk factors for children developing problematic sexual behavior is um, what are the, um, a, what are the child's kind of trauma, maltreatment history, but then what is uh, the caregiver's capacity for providing support and supervision. And here we have that in Kevin's biological home, um, there was really poor supervision. Um, so now what we've established is that not only does he have um, a history of engaging in sexual behavior, but he also has disruptive behavior and a trauma history. Um, so we know that we're gaining this information from referral, from clinical interview, um, but it's gonna be really, really, really important to also have information about the family's ability to um, succeed in the clinical environment um, and also get a support from um, some standardized measures, which we'll talk about as well. So here we know um, that his foster parents have um, reported that they have a really great support system, um, that they are in this with Kevin, that they're ready to engage in treatment services. Um, Kevin is a bright kid, um, no developmental delays per some testing that he received. Um, and he's been in this home for six months. So that's telling us that it's a relatively stable placement. It sounds like his foster parents are really engaged and ready to in, in, engage in treatment themselves. Um, and we also know that um, it's likely um, that Kevin would be able to participate in treatment as, as typical. Um, no developmental delays, none of that information. So we've got great info about their ability to succeed and in, involve themselves in treatment. Um, so I think one thing that I've certainly fallen victim to is getting all this information, referral information, and thinking, here are my goals. These are the goals that I have for this family. But it's going to be really imperative that we also gather information from foster parents and if there's CPS involvement, information about their goals as well for a child's treatment. Um, I think a lot of times we find that they're similar. Um, however, in the cases that they're not um, as similar, they don't match. Um, that's going to be additional um, information for us to gather and thinking about what we're going to do moving forward with treatment. Um, so what we see here is foster parents want to, uh, the very first thing they said is reduce the sexual behavior. So that's a, a primary concern for them. And if you look at the caseworker's goals as well, that is also there. And then generally decreasing the behavior problems. Um, and his foster parents did mention that they want him to talk a little bit about his traumatic experiences and want him tested for ADHD. Um, and caseworker is really um, putting some, some goals in there for reunification. So remember we talked about how he's not placed with his sister currently because of the sexual behavior that he engaged in with her, um, and so additional considerations there around what treatments are going to be the most helpful for us in helping caseworker to meet those goals of reunification. We also know that there are sexual behavior problems and disruptive behavior problems across multiple environments, which is a really important thing to think about when we're talking about how intrusive are the behaviors, how what environments are they impacting. All right, so let's look at these standardized measures. Um, I know 
uh, Dr. Aaron Taylor did a lot of talking around assessment, um, and uh, I know that she talked about each of these different assessment um, components as well. Um, but here's what we did with Kevin. So it's really important to have a broadband measure. Um, here we're going to be looking at the CBCL, but the BASC is also a great option for that. Um, and that is going to be super helpful for us in supporting our ongoing clinical decision making um, decisions. And um, I think one thing that we're seeing here that will support what we've already heard is that he's got attention problems, um, some aggressiveness. Uh, some social problems and anxiety and depression. And then in the borderline range, which is important to take note of, because this is something we might want to monitor throughout, um, are delinquent behaviors, which include lying um, and some of that withdrawal. I think another thing that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides is, are any of these, can these behavior problems be um, explained by some other concern that's happening? So could any of these be explained by trauma? Could they be explained by something else that's happening, a learning disability, although we know in this case that that is not the case for Kevin. Um, so one thing that I was just recently at a training and someone said to me, you know what, I'm not super bought in to doing um, clinical interview, but also doing measures. They just weren't really bought into the measure usage, and so it got me thinking, uh, well, why, so why do we use both? Um, so I think the, the assessment itself, the paper measure, um, is going to give us additional information to either support or give us new information about uh, what we're learning at referral and in clinical interview. I think the other thing that's important here is I've certainly been in a situation where families are not as um, open in a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, they don't know me very well. I'm a stranger, right? And sometimes it's a little bit easier for them to report things on a, on a document or on a piece of paper. Um, it's less personalized. I'm not staring them right in the face. Um, there's some of those things that kind of remove those walls and take those down. So I think it's super imperative that we're not only doing clinical interview, but using these measures as well to support the decisions that we're making. Another great thing about doing assessment measures is that we can readminister. So I remember how Shell was talking about how important it is that not only are we making that clinical decision right at the beginning, but it's something that we're considering throughout, especially when these kiddos present with multiple difficulties. So now I've got my baseline. Here's where my CBCL was. Let's look at some of these other ones for Kevin. So we also do the Child and Adolescent Trauma Screener, the CATS. If you're not familiar with that, there are tons of trauma screeners out there. This is just the one that we use um, uh, customarily. Um, it's pretty brief, um, doesn't take very long to complete, and also is directly related to the DSM criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. So what we find here, and this is um, self-report and um, caregiver report if the child is over the age of seven. Um, and so what we're seeing here is um, that Kevin is having some avoidance symptoms, so he's not wanting to talk about what happened, or be reminded of the event. He's trying to avoid those things. And then he's also having some hyperarousal symptoms, so having trouble sitting still, not paying attention. Um, I really want to uh, draw your attention to the hyperarousal cluster here, because what does that also sound a whole lot like? It also sounds a lot like their concerns for ADHD, their concerns for overarching behavior problems. And so it's really important that we're kind of teasing those apart and making our differential decisions around what we're going to do treatment-wise. Um, with PTSD, remember we have our four clusters. We've got re-experiencing, avoidance, negative mood or cognition, and hyperarousal. Per the CATS, he is missing two of those four. Um, and re-experiencing is really going to be our textbook PTSD symptom. So this is those flashbacks. This is reenacting in play. This is really where it's taking up a lot of our brain space. We're thinking about it repeatedly in multiple environments. That's not something that's, that's um, indicated on this measure. And so it would be um, important for us to also find out in clinical interview if that's something that's happening. Um, but we're seeing here he does not meet full criteria for PTSD. And I also want to consider, remember Shell said that TFCBT is also, can also reduce problematic sexual behavior problems. Um, the reverse is possible as well, where in PSBCBT we can see a decrease in trauma-related symptoms. So that's an important consideration, especially thinking about where their concerns are related to Kevin's behavior. Um, and then on the child sexual behavior inventory of the CSBI, this is a, a caregiver report 
um, measure, we have a um, clinically significant T-score 63. Um, and this tells us that his sexual behavior is of clinical concern. Um, so I'm really going to start honing in on do I do TFCBT versus PSBCBT versus behavior modification treatment? Because again, we've got all three of this here. So the measures are telling us, these are all the measures we got. Measures are telling us clinically significant sexual behavior problems, clinically significant behavior, generalized behavior problems, and moderate trauma symptoms. So a couple other considerations, I've mentioned uh, uh, many of these, is goal is reunification. Um, but in order for us to, I think, feel positively moving into reunification, it would be important for Kevin to learn some rules and boundaries around sexual behavior. Um, and that would, could be done in TFCBT, but also remember where, where are we clinically significant? We're clinically significant out on that CSBI. What are our primary goals? Problematic sexual behavior. Um, so, um, other considerations, I mentioned this trauma symptoms, but not full criteria for PTSD. Um, and then behavior problems and sexual behavior problems across multiple environments. So clinical decisions here seem to indicate the PSB is of the utmost concern. It's the most intrusive, it's impacting the most environments in addition to the generalized behavior problems. But good news, um, in PSB CBT treatment, we can also address generalized behavior problems. So while it's focused generally on problematic sexual behavior, all of the skills that are being taught are good evidence-based approaches for behavior modification, um, and we encourage caregivers to generalize across environments. Um, we are going to monitor for trauma symptoms. He has a pretty lengthy trauma history, and we were seeing some avoidance and hyperarousal symptoms. So we're not going to just cast that aside. We're going to continue to monitor those, and that can be done at multiple time points throughout treatment um, or at the end of treatment or all of the above. Um, so also need to reevaluate and keep an eye on behavior problems. But we have a pretty good sense that, you know, because we're doing PSB CBT, we might see some decrease in generalized behavior problems. So that's what we did. That was the treatment we decided to, to do. Um, I wanted to um, just expose you all again to the PSB CBT program modules as um, a reminder of some of the things that are, are going to be addressed, excuse me, in Kevin's treatment. Um, the sexual behavior rules, remember that's going to be important for acknowledging um, the rules that he broke um, and gaining some increased understanding around um, rules and boundaries for his private parts in his body. Uh, supervision and monitoring, that's that parenting piece. Um, some other things that I want you to notice is that behavior management component. Remember his foster parents and his caseworker are saying, hey, we've got some really big behavior problems. Well, look, it's included here as well. In addition to, we have relaxation skills, self-control skills, um, uh, things that you would also see in TFCBT treatment. Um, so hopefully we're gonna start to see a decrease in trauma-related symptoms with the use of these components. All right, so let's talk about, we did PSBCBT treatment, we successfully completed, now let's look at um, how Kevin's doing now. So we're gonna reassess. We're using those exact same measures. Um, because remember, clinical decision making is not just a one and done. Um, we're gonna monitor throughout and then um, check in again at the end to see, A, did um, we make the right choice? B, is there something else that Kevin and his family need? Um, are they finished? Can we, can we carry on from here? Um, so in this particular case, um, a lot of his behavior problems did decrease. Um, however, he's still having difficulties at school, especially following visits with his um, mother and stepfather. Um, he has also shared some additional information about his trauma history with his foster parents. Um, and so that right there kind of deems me for some concern around trauma symptoms. Um, they have, his behavior problems have become more difficult to manage with um, the um, discussion around reunification with his mom and stepdad. Um, so he has been given coping skills and he's been given ways of coping with his um, emotions, um, but we're just not quite getting at what's needed here, it sounds like, for his stress level and his behavior difficulties. Foster parents still want an ADHD evaluation. Um, so what did we do? Let's look at um, these measures. So we reassessed for um, we did that broadband measure again. We redid the child behavior checklist, and this is, again, it's a foster parent report. Um, so we're no longer seeing problematic sexual behavior. That's great news. 
Um, that means that treatment address, PSB, supervision and monitoring is, is um, in place by foster parents. Um, he has been able to acknowledge uh, the rules that he broke, um, increase his coping skills around making good choices with his body and with his private parts, so that's great news. Um, we saw a decrease in anxiety, his delinquent behavior, and his aggression. However, still some difficulties with social problems and attention problems. Um, good news, though, there were no increased difficulties on the CBCL. It was either the same as previously um, or some things have gone down. Um, on the cats, there's, there was no decrease in trauma-related symptoms. So while it is common for trauma symptoms to decrease while in PSBCBT treatment, it is certainly not the case for every kiddo. And so I think this is just giving us information. What, is, what are we missing in PSBCBT that um, Kevin did not get um, and that he needs to get an additional treatment? Um, we are also seeing an increase of symptoms on the cats for negative mood. So now he's meeting criteria. I apologize about that, folks. Looks like they uh, they got cut off once more. Just bear with us for a minute or two. Tim, have you signaled our presenters that we cannot hear them? Are they aware? They are. They're calling back in right now. Okay. They should be right on right now, actually. While we're waiting, if any of you are beginning to formulate questions about the approach our presenters are suggesting here, our different techniques or assessment methods they use, please um, begin to type them in so we can get the questions um, Pose to them once we get them reconnected. Thanks. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where uh, it cut off, um, but maybe someone could.
cue me to where you lost me and I can back up just a hair? The slide just before the one you're showing. Okay. Great. So here is where we did uh, re-administration of some of the measures that were utilized um, prior to beginning PSBCBT treatment. Um, and so just very quickly, I know we want to get to questions. Um, and uh, some of the things that we saw was uh, good news that uh, the information on the CBCL that um, was applicable for pretreatment, we saw a lot of decreases um, at post-treatment. Some areas where we did not see any decreases was in social problems and the attention problems, but nothing increased from the time of pretreatment. So it's great. That means treatment was effective in a lot of areas. Um, his CSBI was also no longer elevated, not clinically significant, so no more problematic sexual behavior difficulties. However, if we look at the cats here, we're seeing um, continued symptom elevation for avoidance and hyperarousal, and we are now also seeing um, some difficulties in the negative mood cognition category. So he's now got three of the four um, post-traumatic stress symptoms. So that's definitely something that we're going to want to um, really think uh, pretty heavily about and make considerations about um, what to do moving forward. I wanted to make note that although he's not having the re-experiencing symptoms, it's really important to hone in on that avoidance category because what we often see here is that it's tough to talk about and think about our trauma, right? It makes sense that we would want to avoid those things. So might we be seeing that he's not discussing or endorsing re-experiencing symptoms? Because that would mean endorsing that I need to talk about this um, and instead avoiding is much easier. So definitely consideration to make. And again, this is why we're not just using the measure. We're also going to use interview and information we're gathering from foster parents, uh, in this case also caseworker, in, in making those decisions. Um, so super quickly, the decision that was made for, for after the PSB CBT treatment was to review the um, PSB CBT modules that also coincide with TFCBT. So that's relaxation, affect regulation, cognitive coping. Remember, that's all done in PSB CBT as well. We'd already done some psychoeducation. That was one thing that we um, said at the beginning of treatment that was important. Um, so what we're missing in PSB CBT, though, is the gradual exposure. It's the trauma narrative. So might it be really important for Kevin to have um, that information? and be able to go through the gradual exposure process um, and apply it to trauma reminders. Because remember, he's also having visits with his mom and stepdad. Um, he is also potentially going to be moving in to have some visits with his sister, because the whole goal here is reunification. If he's going to be placed into these environments um, and he's being reminded of his trauma, and that's when we're seeing disruptive behaviors, it's going to be really important to help him with those trauma reminders. And that's done in the gradual exposure trauma narrative piece of TFCBT. Um, the other thing we're really going to make sure we're doing is supporting his foster parents and continuing to apply those behavior management strategies. Um, you know, they're not going to be very different across uh, TFCBT and PSBCBT. It's really the same evidence-based treatment strategies um, for parenting skills. Um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of tweaking and uh, creative brain to uh, figure out how to make that work as it relates to trauma symptoms. Um, so super fast, I know we're over, I just have to make a plug that because we are doing evidence-based treatments, it's really important to continue to maintain fidelity. So, you know, one of the things that Shell and I have been communicating is that these um, EVPs are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, and so there is a lot of wiggle room in each of these to make sure that you're applying these different components. Um, for different behaviors in each of the different kinds of treatment. Um, but it's going to be so very important to make sure that you're maintaining fidelity to the model because we obviously see increased treatment outcomes for families when that's happening, among other things. Um, and the research is cited here if you guys want to look a little bit further into that. Because uh, this is about problematic sexual behavior, we all, I just wanted to quickly plug um, some information about integrating PSB treatment into other evidence-based practice. We've highlighted, or excuse me, capitalized caregiver involvement. Remember, remember, remember that caregiver involvement is going to be one of the highest predictors of change in their children. And so much of what we're doing in PSB CBT treatment involves caregiver from the standpoint of supervision, monitoring, uh, reinforcing behavior management skills, reinforcing use of the child's coping skills. Um, and then these are just some other areas where you can continue to kind of apply problematic sexual behavior work into the work that you're already doing in your good evidence-based practice work. 
Um, I also would be remiss to not comment on um, an advanced training that's being developed by um, myself, in addition to some colleagues and the developers of the of, of TFCB team. Um, and um, it, is a, it is an advanced training for TFCBT specifically to address problematic sexual behavior and how that is done throughout each of the, the components of TFCBT. Um, we also, um, the, we are having a national symposium on the sexual behavior of youth um, that's coming up in June. Um, it will be held in Norman, Oklahoma, and there's a lot of great things for you all to see um, and be exposed to, including the advanced TFCBT um, seminar is also happening, and it's a full day, uh, full day discussion. So, um, just quick disclaimer: um, part of the uh, work that we do through NCSBY is uh, supported by a grant through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, but uh, what we're saying and what we're talking about does not necessarily reflect um, those of OJJDP. So just as a, a caveat there. Um, so we will turn it over for questions. I'm so sorry with the sound issues that we ran over, um, and but we look forward to answering your questions. Great. Well, thank you for that wonderful, rich, and nuanced description of um, your um, imaginary client there, or hypothetical client. One of the things, as I'm waiting for questions to come in, um, that I noticed is that you were talking about an assessment technique that emphasizes evaluating the whole child, not just factors that um, evaluate a risk of one kind or another. Can you describe your um, philosophy or guiding um, thoughts around doing an assessment? That, because as you know, it, it's quite a bit different than typically happens with adults where actuarial instruments dominate the field, or even for older children. What's your thought about that, please? So we find, just as Amanda highlighted, we have to assess each outlet, each behavior that these kids are presenting with. We do a disservice if we focus solely on problematic sexual behavior and ignore trauma symptoms or ignore behavior concerns. Um, we want to make sure that our, our guiding light is what is, in fact, impacting this family. And without evaluating a big picture, we're really missing it. And again, it's a disservice. That is great. Um, no questions yet. Can we uh, have any, any thoughts from the audience on, on other issues they're concerned about? And I will continue to ask questions myself then. Um, <laughs> You, um, so I, I get the chance to ask what I'm interested in. You've um, um, used, you, you suggested some techniques that are, are some instruments that you use in addition to interviewing. Can you describe um, the way you conduct your interviews? How do you go about that? Who do you interview for how long? What kind of questions do you ask? Sure, yeah, I think that, um, uh, at least from what I've heard in past training experiences, is that oftentimes our interview process um, is sometimes considered a little bit unique. Um, we tend to a lot, it really depends on the age of the child. Um, as Shell mentioned, we're really focusing on um, children here um, up to age 12, so it's gonna be very different for the adolescent population. Um, however, our intake procedures tend to um, uh, be about three hours in length, um, and we're gonna have a, an interviewer for the caregiver, um, and an interviewer for the child. So it's two separate folks that are that are completing those interviews. Um, and we have a, a really structured interview process. So we're getting at, um, of course, information about the problematic sexual behavior that occurred, um, information about family history, trauma history, um, uh, developmental history, medical history, really a good biopsychosocial history on this on this family. Um, and then we're also uh, doing those assessment measures that we talked about. Um, we utilize a handful for both research purposes as well as for clinical decision-making purposes. Uh, in the child interview, it does tend to be quite a bit shorter, as I'm sure you all can imagine. Um, we are asking them um, to talk about the sexual behavior rules that they broke um, in that interview piece. It's not meant to be a high-pressure situation. It's not meant to be this really um, stressful, um, it's not an interrogation, it's really to gain an understanding from them of um, how they understand the rules, how they understand the rules that they broke, um, and if they even have knowledge about that these rules exist. Um, we're also with them doing a broadband measure, a trauma screener, um, and a intelligence screener. So we're not gonna do a full IQ test, it's uh, one of the Kaufman tests, it's a KBIT. 
that we're doing with the kiddos. And that gives us that good information about how are they functioning and how will they do in the therapy environment. One of the questions that that raises for me that I, I think is fascinating is if, if I uh, remember correctly, there's probably about a dozen ways to teach reading and no one would ever think of trying to teach um, a child who didn't read, or, or all children who didn't know how to read exactly the same way. And curiously, our, his, our field has a history of a one size fits all, that it doesn't matter whether the kid is intellectually capable or not, emotionally traumatized or not, we're gonna do what we're gonna do come hell or high water. And it sounds like you have a, a very elaborate decision process where you evaluate the child and based on the information you gather, you decide what kind of treatment and how to provide it. Can you talk a little bit about how that evolved and, and what your thinking is on that, please? Sure. So as Amanda mentioned, we do a cognitive screener that gives us verbal and nonverbal reasoning skills. And also during our interview or our time with the child, we're assessing their, their reading level. So when we use one of those broadband measures, we are seeing, can they read that? Do they seem to understand the item and how to rate it? And if they have a struggle there, we don't want them to be put into a treatment that they're not going to be successful. So we make um, really a appropriate and useful adaptations. So if there's coverage of something that's in a, in a reading format or a written format, we might we want to adapt it. So maybe it's dictating their response and we're the ones that are generating, you know, the written um, portion of that. And if it seems that they need more visual supports, we're making sure that that's implemented for the kids. Sometimes, too, caregivers haven't thought about how their child is functioning and why certain rules or certain things in their home don't seem to be successful. So we find ourselves talking through how to shift things up in the home as well because, again, our goal is to have these kids and families be successful, leave our doors with the ability to not have continued treatment. And part of that is making adaptations to treatment as well as the home and school settings even. That's, that's really helpful. You know, one of the things that's, that's interesting is um, I hope we can get to the point where as much care is taken in assessing problematic sexual behavior as goes into an IEP for a child with learning disabilities. I think they deserve the same degree of care and, and clinical skill. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, whether you do CBT in groups or individually and whether you do the, the skill training with parents in groups or individually? Sure. So um, specifically as it rates, uh, relates to PSB CBT, we actually have um, a, both options. So we have a group treatment program, which is the one that's been around the longest. And remember, if you think back to some of the research, um, that the group treatment program is going to be super duper effective for um, treating um, these difficulties. And so the way that it structures is we have two groups of kids um, that are, are, are meeting together, and it's based on age. Um, and then we also have a caregiver group. Um, so the caregivers are learning right alongside their, their children. And what's really nice is that we tend to keep them about one step ahead of their kiddos um, so that they can also kind of start to master these skills as, as their child is doing the same and to help to reinforce their, their child mastering those skills. Um, we also um, have a kind of a, a family model for treating problematic sexual behavior, um, and that is done uh, on an individual family basis. Um, the way that it's structured is that different sessions hone in on different um, pieces of the modules that we talked about earlier. Um, some of them are caregiver-only components. Some of them are um, child and caregiver components or just child. Um, but Throughout, everybody is staying um, involved um, in both group and family. There's time where kids and caregivers are spending time together with the therapist to reinforce use of these skills. Uh, kids can really show off the skills that they learned and, um, you know, show, the, show their caregiver that they're, they're getting this and they're learning it, and then they get to practice the skills together. Um, so so we, do, we do a little bit of everything. The one thing to add to the group modality is um, – some people are concerned with utilizing this treatment in a group setting, and I want to bring up the positive in that is that families that deal with problematic sexual behavior with their children can feel very isolated, be very stressed, and feel like they're the only ones, you know, in the state, in the world dealing with this. And there's a social dynamic to the group modality, not just for the parents, but the kids to also see, I'm not alone in this. 
other kids are working through it, and I have um, a team behind me to make sure that I'm moving forward in a positive direction. That's great. And one final question. Um, this is going a little bit far afield. You didn't mention the ACEs score, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Do you have any sense of um, how the degree of, of adverse childhood experiences contributes to the narrative you construct or the kind of problems you're addressing with your various components? The, so, the losses, um, maltreatment, and so forth? Sure. I, I would be inclined for those that want more to listen to Jane Stalewski's overview of problematic sexual behavior. What we take into account is the multitude of factors that can impact a child developing or engaging in problematic sexual behavior, which aligns a lot with adverse childhood impacts. Um, that's something that we want to conceptualize and take into account when we're thinking about who these kids are. Um, treatment, because if you think of how you would treat um, youth that are impacted by some type of maltreatment or trauma, is going to be in a CBT base. So like Amanda talks through the overlap of TSB-CBT and TSCBT, it overlaps quite a bit so that kids are getting information and caregivers are getting information on regardless of the issue, regardless of the stressor, here are some ways that we can appropriately manage um, and act in a way that's, that's okay outside of just sexual behavior. So mm -hmm. again, I would be inclined to go to James to hear more about how we take that into account and also the protective factors. So we, and we know what can impact the development of this, but we want to make sure that um, the data out there on how youth can be set up in a positive trajectory period are looking at protective factors. And if you think about those, you can see how they are laid out within the modules of PSBCBT. Great. Thank you for a wonderful, informative presentation. We just have a few housekeeping details um, to wrap things up here today, but thank you so much. That was very helpful and informative. Thank you, Kim, everybody. Um, so a few last final announcements. Um, our CE process has recently changed. Paid CE credits will be available for psychologists and social workers for all webinars in our 2017-2018 season. For details about how to obtain CE credits, please visit www.nearypress.org slash webinars and read through our new CE process. If you still have questions after that, you can email Kristen at klobish at neary.com. I'd also like you to know that we publish a free monthly newsletter in which we discuss a new or controversial journal article or research paper and examine its implications for clinicians in the field. You are automatically signed up for this resource and we hope you'll find it useful. Again, please become, consider becoming a sponsor for our 2017-2018 webinar series. We're thrilled to be presenting a brand new slate of webinars this year driven by the feedback that our audience has provided about which topics would be most useful. When you sign up to be a sponsor, as our thanks to you, we'll send you two of Neary Press's popular titles, Current Applications and Current Perspectives, or two other new books if you've already received these. If you become a sponsor now, you'll be guaranteed seats not only to this season's remaining webinars in April, May, and June, I'm sorry, we just did April, in May and June, but also to all webinars in the 2018-2019 season. And if you sign up as an organization, your organization is guaranteed 15 seats. We will also do your monthly registration for you. We will publicize your name or organization on our website, in our publicity, and on each webinar. Sponsorship is $98 for individual and $250 for organizations. If you're interested in being a sponsor, please contact us directly at info at nearypress.org or call us. Finally, thank you to our sponsors. You can see them here on the screen. They are organizations, agencies, and individuals. We would not be able to hold these free webinars without their support. And finally, if you like this webinar, you can see previous webinars on our website at www.nearypress.org and on Neary Press's YouTube channel. It's possible to pay for CE credits for all past re recorded webinars. Thank you again to Shell and Amanda for such a great webinar. And a huge thank you to all of you for attending. I'd like to say again how much we welcome your feedback, so please complete your evaluation form when you close out the webinar. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>